with new birth in oblivion, in silence. The memory of eternal soul is erased. Why do I incarnate in another life? And who is the one walking next to me? The threat of karma is tangled, hidden from view. Perhaps we've been here together before. And once again, on the sacred path, we walk the eternal Korra again. It's my first time going to Tibet. I'm anticipating it because I read a lot of scriptures where a rather difficult path of great yogis and yoginis was described. I'm very excited to walk along the same paths, visit the same places, and maybe even feel the energy of these great places. I visited Tibet three years ago. I was near Mount Kailash, went to the North Face. I'm going there for austerity. This is a unique place. The place where you can feel the energy. The place where you can overcome yourself, meet some challenges, meet with yourself. And maybe on this yoga tour, I can discover something that will allow me to teach during the next year. To teach effectively, to share the energy that I can accumulate on this journey. The first time, it was probably just interesting. And then, when I came the second time, third and fourth, I started to keep track of the changes that were constantly happening. So I come back a changed person from these trips. A little wiser, calmer. And this allows me to see more, to see the path that I have chosen. To me, Tibet is a place that helps to face some energy of reality, which helps to change my view of myself, an idea of what world is right. That is, to see a certain rigidity and dependence on comfort, which is present in our daily life. And in Tibet, we can face what actually exists within us. It turns out that you discover reality. It may be a bit unpleasant, but it's good. Because then, new horizons open up and illusions disappear. I'm going for the sixth time. And previous chorus were different and not very easy. If I recall the last trip, Korra was very hard for me, probably the hardest of all. I even had to ascend on the horse. So, of course, I'm very worried now how this trip will go. In addition to many organizational issues that need to be addressed, I still have to go all the way on my own. Because there are many teachers who are coming with us this time, we will have a very significant Korra. So, a lot of events can happen. Some may be negative, some positive. But in any case, it will be memorable. The places which are associated with the great practitioners of the past allow you to understand yourself better and, as a result, people come back with new insights. Probably the main goal of this trip is for the participants to remember the path that they've been following from life to life. is an ancient wisdom from hundred paths always choose the one that will be harder 
the smoke of old defilements will vanish. The obstacle will become your teacher. I don't really like to travel, especially by planes and trains. I love to travel by car. But when I was invited to go to Kailash, I broke my mala beads and got the new ones from Rudraksha. We also got a large embroidered portrait of Shiva as a gift. So everything somehow began to take shape in such a way that I understood I really need to go. Although internally, I felt lazy and not wanting to leave the comfort zone. My laziness said, no, stay and find yourself some excuse. But I overcame myself, and today in the morning, when I got out of the airplane, I realized that it was a right decision. And as one wise man who encouraged me to come on this trip said, this trip will help many of my students to progress on their path. So for the most part, I'm here for my students, for my friends. Being here changes me a little from the inside. Basically, that's why I come back here. It happens because of my internal work, because of austerity, because I am overcoming some challenges, obstacles. A man who conquers himself is greater than one who conquers a thousand men in battle. Buddha Shakyamuni The modern world is rather selfish. Everything that we face, in one way or another, is aimed at gaining pleasure and living life just for ourselves. The Buddha's teaching is fundamentally different from all that now exists in this world. Tibet is the place where this teaching had arrived from India. And here, you can really find a lot of sources in which the Buddha's teaching is preserved. One can see his followers here. It's really interesting to study, because it shows that it's possible to live as an altruist, that it's possible to live not for oneself, but for others. I think the journey affects all people very differently. Some become more free and feel some relief. Some get anxious that there are a lot of challenges, the unknown, surprises ahead, and on the contrary, feel strained. But it's natural that everyone feels differently than in their cities, in their countries. Perhaps in the beginning of the tour, the most important is to stay open and accept the challenges that this trip, this place, this energy has put in front of you. It's important not to resist the changes that can happen to a person. First of all, I expect from the tour an interaction with a specific field, which is much purer in energy, of higher frequency than the one I'm used to in my ordinary life. I believe that it's interaction with the pure energy that will allow me to make the right decisions in life. Even before the flight in Moscow, I could feel this energy. Obviously, the future hardships that are coming on this tour were felt. But nevertheless, there was also a feeling that something very important is due to happen. Something really crucial and maybe something that would drastically change people's lives. I really want to get to this altitude as soon as possible, although I've never been to the highlands. I absolutely don't have any fear that it will be difficult. I already want to plunge into this atmosphere, survive this tour, transformation, and see the results.
As the Buddha predicted 500 years after his leaving this world, Buddhism in India would be almost destroyed. Perhaps knowing this prediction, the ancient cities and yogis recommended preserving the Buddha's teachings in Tibet. Why in Tibet? Now, probably no one knows. Maybe because people here have conservative views on new trends, and if they acquire something, it's for a long time. We are now using the teachings that Padmasambhava preserved in Tibet, and which have survived to the present day. Samye is a unique place. A unique place because of the fact that it's one of the most ancient monasteries where fortunately until nowadays the energy of the past has remained. As soon as we arrived, I already had this palpable feeling in my heart. I really look forward to meeting with Samye, with the atmosphere of celebration and magic. Behind this gate, there is a monastery where very ancient relics have been preserved. Padmasambhava's mala beads and Shantarashita's call are believed to be still kept here. It was Shankarakshita who offered King Trisong Detson to invite Padmasambhava to Tibet. But few people know that Shantarakshita is the embodiment of Rahula. Buddha Shakyamuni had a son Rahula, so Rahula reincarnated as Shantarakshita, and his skull is still kept here. As long as samsara revolves the worlds, the thread of karma weaves the script of the game. The teacher and student are born together to always keep the sacred dharma. I was probably impressed the most by all the relics that were left since the Guru Padmasambhava's time. The energy in that small, nondescript room really differs from the other rooms in monastery halls. This wall has had a tough life. When by the Shantarashita's instruction, King Trisong Detsen decided to strengthen Buddhism in Tibet, an unpleasant story happened because during the day, the construction workers were trying to build something. But during the night, supposedly, the local spirits were destroying everything. I have a suspicion that it was not the spirits, but some local crooks. But the fact that the construction workers built during the day, and when they came back to the construction site the next day, there were no walls. Everything changed with the Padmasambhava's arrival. When he came and proved who was in charge, the wall had been built. The Samya Monastery was built using the labor of a huge number of people, and by investing a lot of energy into this construction, these people have shown us a great example. First of all, an example of the ability to negotiate with each other, because in the beginning, when one category of people built this temple in the morning, and another category of beings destroyed the temple in the evening, or to be precise, at night, no progress happened. Spiritual path can be realized only if we can agree with our, so to speak, days and our inner night. According to the legend, it was the demons who at first destroyed this temple in Samya and afterwards helped to build and protect it. What we can learn from the legend secondly is this selflessness with which people had invested their own energy, time and life into this construction in order to preserve the teaching here for centuries. In this place, I was mostly impressed by the inner corridor of the Samya temple, which surrounds the altar room. The temple is built on the principle of a mandala, the celestial palace. 
there's always a flow of powerful centripetal upward moving energy which is created in the center of a mandala and it's precisely in this corridor where it can be felt very strongly there are objects in our world that create such a movement these are the trees or tongues of fire flame which soar upward but mandala is a man-made creation and this mandala was transferred from the more subtle worlds to our world by padmasambhava when he laid the foundation of the temple in the 11th century In order for Cora to be as effective, favorable, and safe as possible, you need to tune into the energy of these places. And this tuning happens best in this place. Because, on the one hand, this is the place where the first stone of Buddhism throughout this vast territory was laid. And, on the other hand, it is one of the few places where the energy of Buddhism is preserved due to the fact that the monastery is located away from all tourist routes. My subjective opinion is that life after Kora around Kailash changes dramatically. The journey, of course, physically begins in Samya. How much we manage to transform our energy before coming to Kailash will be determined by how effective we spend our time there. Because you can run Kora as a tourist, take selfies and say, oh, I've been at 5,700 meters, I'm cool. Or you can have a deeply mystical sacred experience that will allow you to seriously advance in your practice, maybe remember your past lives. Someone will remember their karmic friends because surely, during Kora, the thread of karma is woven in such a way that the people who have a karmic connection with you will go next to you, and it will definitely be manifested. There is an opinion that this is the footprint of Padmasambhava in his wrathful form. At the time of Buddhist formation in Tibet, there were some forces that opposed the spread of the Buddhist teaching. Then Padmasambhava had to take such an angry form and explain to not particularly teachable beings about the importance of the Buddha's teachings. We are now at the altitude of over 4,000 meters, in the town of Chimpu, near the Samya Monastery. This is one of the first Buddhist monasteries in Tibet. It's known to host a great debate between Bonposts and Buddhists. For some time, Bon religion and Buddhism coexisted in Tibet. But because of the occasional conflicts and disagreements, which surely were unacceptable for a state religion, King Trisong Detsen decided to choose any one religion. To do this, he convened various scientists, mystics, and practitioners of both traditions and decided to have a dispute between them. For the most part, Buddhists were more superior than Bonposts in their rhetoric and supernatural abilities. And everyone saw it. As a result, the Bonposts began to use dirty tricks, sent various misfortunes, spells, but this was successfully repelled by Buddhist practitioners. Yeshe Sogyal also participated in these disputes. She prevented some terrible black spells which Bonpo sent. As a result, Buddhism prevailed in Tibet.
now, we are in a very interesting place. The altitude here is more than 4,000 meters. This monastery is called Gan Den, a very majestic building. There are a lot of different rooms in which there are the Buddha's statues, the statues of Lama Tsongkhapa. This place still preserves the energy of the ancient practitioners. Most likely, this is due to the fact that the place is quite inaccessible and not so many tourists wander here. In this monastery, we can see an interesting tradition, which goes back to ancient times. This tradition is connected with the transfer of energy from the teacher to the student. An ancient master, Tilopa, helped his student Naropa to achieve enlightenment this way. And here the visitors of this monastery can get a kind of blow on the head with the Tsongkhapa slipper, and this way engage with the energy of this teacher, mentor and a great yogin. Here, there are a lot of caves where the great yogis and yoginis, including Yasha Tsogyal, used to practice. I was impressed by her story when I read a book about her. And here, when we climb to this altitude of more than 4,000 meters, and many of us were at such altitude for the first time, of course, we went through a lot of austerities and difficulties. And in life, we often think that something is wrong we lack something, not the right people surround us. We live not in the right house. Maybe we don't have the material goods that we deserve. So when I read the biography of Yasha Tsugyal, I learned that around these places the following story happened. Her teacher, Guru Padmasambhava, left her to practice alone, and several years she practiced in the cave on her own and went through many hardships. You can imagine what kind of hardships there were. Like clothes, food, not having any strength, or perhaps motivation to practice. And she prayed to her guru, urged him to appear, and said that she could no longer handle it anymore. Then the guru appeared to her and said the following, You, the maiden from Korchan, are still attached to your appearance. You still crave fame satisfaction. You crave beauty. You want to please everyone. Then she realized that and continued her practice. In this moment, this story really impressed me very much, in the sense that we are too much attached to our material aspects, which of course are fleeting in this world. After visiting these places, you understand and realize the scriptures biographies of great yogis and yoginis of the past much deeper. I first heard about Yeshe Tsugyal about six years ago. After reading her life story for the first time, I just believed in what was written there. 
Despite the fact that there were a lot of legends, some miraculous events, which at first glance may bring some doubts, I didn't have any contradictions, and this life story inspired me a lot. In addition to the fact that she followed her teacher without question, at the same time she helped everyone around her. When Padmasambhava left this world, she began to serve people without thinking about herself at all, thinking only about others. And maybe these qualities inspire me a lot. Centuries pass at the appointed time, but wisdom still lives between the lines. Just need to brush away the grayish dust. The scriptures will reveal the immortal truth. Behind us, there is a monumental building, the Potala Palace. Maybe, from the point of view of grandeur and size, this is the biggest building in Tibet. It serves several functions at once, secular, since there was a government, ministers and others here, and religious, since the rituals, events, holidays took place here. In addition, it had a protective function. You can take a look. Here you can see the embrasure, various fortifications which helped to hold defense here. Now, the Potala Palace is very popular. There are huge lines here. There are very strict limits on how many people can be inside Potala. This was done primarily to limit the number of people, to organize, to allow everyone to get there, and eliminate the possibility of any traffic jams. So it's not possible to stay in the palace for meditation or chanting of the mantra, because there is strict limitation on time during which it's necessary to pass through all this. But in any case, my subjective opinion, you should take a look both inside and outside this monumental structure at least once in your life. Because the greatness of all that that is behind these white walls simply shakes your imagination. It's just impossible to imagine how all this had been created for thousands of years and made maintained in a proper shape so that we could now come to contact with it. A lot has changed over the last 16 years. On one hand, some things are better, there is good service. On the other hand, certain limitations were brought. When I was in Potala for the first time 16 years ago, we had a guide who was so punchy that he arranged for me to see an interesting room. The Potala ceilings are very high, probably about 15 meters, so the rooms are that huge. In one such room with huge ceilings, the entire wall was packed with sutras, like a library. The most interesting thing is that the local monks explained that these sutras would be opened either in 500 or 700 years. So this is some sort of storage. And besides, Padmasambhava gave prediction which teachings in which area can be disclosed in general. Maybe all this will be preserved, and in 500 or 700 years, if we are on this planet, and if we are destined to work with this subject, it is possible we will learn something from these scriptures. Let's hope. Today, the idea of rebirth or reincarnation is not very popular. People don't think that we, as a kind of spiritual element, can reincarnate and accumulate the same experience or different versions of similar experience in different lives and incarnations. And here, in the Potala Palace, the ideas of reincarnation are very well depicted because social hierarchy naturally needed these ideas to be implemented at that time. So the Dalai Lama was reborn at some point. Prior to his death, he left a note which could be used to find him in his next birth. And it's important to note that this birth was not transferred from a father to a son, and he was not born in the same family, but in different families, in different regions, maintaining the integrity of the people and integrity of their country that way.
In the capital of Tibet, Bahasa, there is a wonderful place, the Jokhan Temple. Buddhists appreciate this temple very much. Pilgrims like to visit frequently because there is the famous Buddha statue called Jovo. This statue is believed to be one of the most ancient statues. When you walk by the statue, you always feel a certain energy, certain force, inspiration. According to one legend, this statue was built by the architect of the gods, Vishvakarma. Jokong is translated as the house of the Buddha. It was built by King Songtsen Gampo. According to legend, before leaving this world, Buddha Shakyamuni decided to leave his image out of compassion to the people. And for this purpose, he invited a heavenly sculptor who took the dimensions of his body. Based on these dimensions, four statues were sculpted during the life of Buddha Shakyamuni. Two statues are known to exist during that time, in Nepal and in China. And Song Tseng Kampo married the Nepalese and Chinese princesses so that these statues could get to Tibet. The truth lies in simplicity. Local residents perform Tibetan prostrations. It is one of the most powerful practices that I know now. It is pretty simple. But the essence of this practice is not in the ideal form of the exercise, but in concentrating on the image in front of which the prostrations are done. Right now, the Tibetans are concentrating on the Buddha's statue at the Jokong Monastery. This practice transforms energy very well, and it's an antidote to pride. In the morning, we visited the Potala Palace. Tonight, the Jokong. These are truly holy places for Buddhism. But what they have now turned into is, honestly, very sad. Instead of the monks, who are engaged in self-development and trying to give something to the world, you see a lot of tourists who just want to take a picture with the statues in the background. They do not know whose statue this is. They just want to take a selfie. But despite so many people, the places are still powerful. We visited the statue of the Buddha today. The statue is considered to be created by the heavenly architect. That is, the divine energy created the image of the most perfect being in the world. This statue is similar to many existing images of Buddhas, and it is not some kind of revelation. But when you walk by it, you have a warm feeling. You feel light. The very essence of the divine energy is still here. And while it stays in our world, and there are people who will search and make pilgrimages, I think that our world will develop. chakra, or the will of samsara, is the image that was left to us thanks to one of the disciples of Buddha Shakyamuni, Mount Galyana. And here we see the causes of karma and how we can overcome it, as well as the reasons of why we are born again and again in this world. In the center of this image, we see the three main poisons, ignorance, anger, and passion, which are depicted as animals. There are also other circles which show us how good and bad karma works and which worlds exist. We also see a very interesting circle called 12 links of dependent origination, where we see how our ignorance works and how we can overcome it. We've already traveled about 300 to 400 kilometers. Yesterday, we spent all day on the road. There are two more days on the road ahead of us. We are approaching Kailash. And what's interesting is how one's energy changes after we leave the bustling city. We left Lhasa behind. A lot of shops, restaurants, delicious food. And ahead of us are austerities, mountains, great rivers, lakes, and silence. And this is very important. 
because it's very easy to keep inner silence when you are in the surrounding space of silence. Yesterday, we chanted mantra in a small group, but the mantra sounded differently, and it's because there is different energy around us. Silence for kilometers in one direction and the other, and it strikes your imagination. Under the starry tent on the Tibetan land, I remembered a picture from the past. The stone guardian of the Vedic stories, the summit of Kailash reaches into the sky. I want to recall all that I have forgotten, that wisdom I kept in the past births of mine. Through time, through the lifetimes, through thousands of years, I bow before you, my beloved Tibet. The second day of the journey towards Kailash from Lhasa, we are now at an altitude of 4,600 meters above sea level. The nearest houses are a few dozens of kilometers away, deserted places, and there are only mountains around us. The mountains are considered to be one of the monumental phenomenon in our world. And they were created by gods in order to minimize the desires of the people who will try to develop in the future. If we refer to the biographies, we'll always see the practitioners would retire in two places. If they had a chance, they'd go to the mountains. Or if it was a place with no mountains, they would go to the forests. Never did practitioners stay in the places where people lived. Unfortunately, modern society motivates people to do anything, but realization of the deep essence of self, understanding why we've come into this world, which goals need to be achieved here, what needs to be left behind. But at the same time, despite the fact that in this life they forgot all the accumulated earlier level of knowledge, deep inside experienced practitioners have an intuitive understanding of why they've come into this world. In order to bring it out, they need to go to some deserted place where the external information noise will not interfere with what will come out from the inside. It's very quiet here, there are no desires here, and when you come up here, Every movement takes an effort. Instead of running around, showing joyful emotions, waving hands, doing some stupid things, awareness appears. It becomes difficult to move and live. And you start to think ahead. You start to think, do I need to do this action? Is it okay for me to go or become emotional? And a certain degree of calmness comes, certain evenness, certain awareness, which then helps us to bring these qualities into our ordinary life when we descend from the mountains and live in a society in the city. Tibetans worship lakes the same as the mountains. Lake Manasarovar, which we now see, is considered the most sacred lake. During the pilgrimages, Tibetans began their kora around Kailash by going around Lake Manasarovar. They walk around the lake in about five days because the length of the second route is about 100 kilometers. Blessed be Lake Manasarovar. As the statistics show, people who visited this place, and even just washed their face in this lake, could feel a certain blissful state. Perhaps this water has some secret, or some meaning. But the fact is, that people feel certain unity with the world after a visit to the lake.
The silk of the lake flows softly and shines. The wisest yogin here found his abode. The great, the compassionate, the incomprehensible. Here lived the guru who was born of the lotus. Alas, the Tibetan sunrise will not show the lost track of the Aryan culture. It's covered with sand like a mandala tracery. Only inner vision can discover it. Kailash, a snow-covered shield of another world. The God's name sounds louder and louder in my heart. I utter, feeling both tremble and fear. Om Namah Shivaya, Namah Shivaya. Shiva is a very interesting personality who has a lot to learn from. When you follow the path of yoga, Shiva may be the deity who can help a lot on the path. He is probably the most sensible, fair, and at the same time, yogically ascetic god, whose example we can follow. Being on the shore of this lake allows you to experience very unusual, great sensations. Here everything is saturated by the motherly, universal energy of love, because it's associated with poverty, Shiva's wife, the mother of all things, the mother of all living beings, their patroness. Lake Manasarovar and Kailash are considered to be the two energies. Respectively, Kailash is the male energy, the energy of Shiva, the defender, the benefactor of all people, of all practitioners who are engaged in self-development. And Lake Manasarovar is the soft female energy, the energy of poverty, the energy of love, understanding, acceptance. There is also a belief that if a woman swims in the waters of this lake, she will be able to bring a highly evolved soul into this world. But nevertheless, it's probably better to just wash their face and hands and show respect for the sacred lake. The energy can be felt everywhere. It's not necessary to swim here. I've just got a chance to wash my face with the waters of the legendary Lake Manasarovar. This is one of the most revered lakes in the world. The lake is really unusual. On one hand, you can feel the power of this lake. On the other hand, the energy is very soft. I hope that this energy will allow you to effectively walk the outer core around the Mount Kailash. Today, early in the morning, we started Kora and walked literally just a few meters from the starting point. And immediately, as soon as we passed the stupa, these majestic mountains began. When you come across them for the first time, you get such a great impression. You understand your pettiness, the pettiness of your contrived huge self, big ego, big ambitions. And when you stop near these mountains, you understand their greatness and your place. And for a person who follows the spiritual path, it's extremely important to visit these places, to feel this power, and to measure it against yourself. This will help to look at the world, at your actions more realistically and adequately, and continue your path. With palms together near my heart, by the sky wall, 
In God's abode, I'm seeking silence, the inner self forgotten before. Unlock the door for me. Let me in. It's very hard to convey this state, especially with words. I've had several moments like this in my life, when I got to a place where I didn't really want to talk. The absence of words gives me a chance to hear a voice coming from the inside. Even though it's tiny, not very loud. To get some information, some hints what I should focus on at the moment and what I need to do. Friends, the east face of Kailash is behind us. Actually, we're going through some challenges. High altitude, sandy path, crest, occasional rain. It's very hard to breathe at this altitude. We are at an altitude of 5,000 meters. And the person who is watching this film can ask a reasonable question. Why? A huge group of people is going to the mountains going through austerities, living in not the most pleasant conditions in order to be here at the foot of Kailash. I would like to tell you my opinion why these difficulties and austerities are needed. When a person lives a normal life, he seems to be fine. We can say he lives in an illusion, in the prison of the matrix. And then, at some point of his life, some challenges start to come. Some have problems in the office, some in the family, others with their health. Very often people begin to blame others. I have this problem because of… But it's much more important to look inside and ask yourself, but why is this happening to me? What for? If the person asks this question, this is, in fact, the most important question in his life, because as soon as he asked this question, he got on the path. He begins to look for answers. And as soon as he shifted his focus to himself, asked the right question, found the answer to this question, there is an evolution. He went one step up. And this problem will not bother him anymore. This is very important. So look, why do we come here? Whatever a secular person can work out in a year, two, three, or maybe ten years, can be worked out here in a few days. Some are going through selfishness, some through greed, some are overeating, some are arrogant. And if a person is able to develop a proper understanding of this, shift his focus inward, then he has a real chance to make a serious turn in his evolution. It's as if a person got into the elevator and hop hop, went up to the fourth floor. If he has enough awareness to understand the internal lessons and enough energy to master them, he can really work out most of his internal problems here in a very short period of time. You can hear the sound of a river flowing from a glacier. This is crystal clear water. On the way here, we drank it a few times. It gave us some strength. Next, we're going to the north face. Our path lies there. And in order to go on such a serious journey, we sure need support of the gods, protectors, the forces which help on the path of self-development. No good deed is done without them. I think that austerity should be reasonable. If a yoga teacher has accumulated a sufficient amount of energy, 
a sufficiently large amount of negative karma and at the same time he prepared well, maybe it's worth for them doing the radial walks to the faces of Kailash. But for the sake of pure curiosity, just to know how it is, I would not recommend it. I remember myself in 2012, 2013, when I hadn't yet started teaching. And I wish I could bring back the energy level that I had at the time. And for this, I think it's worth the effort. It's worth doing some serious austerities, doing Kora around Kailash. The Dromala Pass The person who has overcome this boundary is considered to be able to work out his basic karmic flaws with which he came here. The highest point of Kora is the altitude of about 5,700 meters. It's not easy for the Westerners to be here. I even feel a little tongue-tied. But now, we are already descending, and it will be easier. I have an interesting feeling here. On one hand, when I first came to the Kailash area, I got a clear feeling that I was back to where I used to be many, many, many times. I walked and knew that if I turn around this corner, I'll see one thing. If I turn around this corner, I'll see another thing. Even though physically, I was in this place for the first time. This time, when I arrived, I knew that I'm probably going to some special for me places. And when I came here, I realized what the rhythm of this area is. Before that, I tried to run somehow, got tired quickly. I had to rest because of the brakes. My heartbeat was off. It was hard to breathe. I got a headache. I can't imagine how I lived through this in 2014. But it paid off. This time, I realized that there is a certain rhythm in which this area functions, and if you move with the rhythm of this area, you become a part of it. You can safely move, exist for a long time. A year ago, during another trip to Tibet, after returning from Kora, I climbed this hill, where we are now standing, and for a very long time viewed the landscape which opens behind my back. In the distance, you can see the Rakshastal Lake, and behind it there is a mountain range, the central peak of which is called Gurla Madhata in Sanskrit. I looked at it for a very long time, and in my head, I had the description of one of the Mahabharata stories, which tells how Hemasena walked to an alpine lake in the Himalayas, where orchards grew and the whole area was covered with dense forests. Sometime later, in the legacy of a yogic practitioner, Milarepa, I learned that, that there was a description of the local area around Kailash, which was also covered with forests, orchards, and other vegetation. Now, if we look at the endless plateau of western Tibet, we can just see the small shrubs, which is enough only for yaks to eat. Modern people know very little about their past. If you drive several hundred kilometers northwest of Darchen, where we are now, We'll get to the valley of the Sotledj River, which is famous for its canyons. Even non-professionals will see that such facilities could be done only by water, a huge amount of water. There was either a large reservoir of water or a huge flow of water, which washed away this territory entirely on its way. Also, if we go in the direction of Puram, which is behind the Lake Rakshastal, we'll see exactly the same scenery. What does it say? The fact that hundreds, perhaps thousands of years ago, the climate in this area was somewhat different. The landscape was also different. And, according to the legends, completely different people lived here. Not the Tibetans who live in Tibet now. According to the legends, there lived people who were called Aryas, who cared about the world around them. It was important for them that the planet should develop together with them. But for some reasons, there was a change of an era, and other energies came to our planet, which benefited a different path of development. 
a path of development that the modern civilization follows. And the great people of antiquity were washed away from the face of the earth by some global cataclysm. But their energy, spirit with which they lived, was left from them, and the whole area around is saturated with their spirit. I thought a lot about what's in common between the Russian North and the Tibetan Himalayas, or the Northern India or Nepal, those places where I am always drawn to and where I am always happy to return. And with time, I understood. It's about the energy, the component, which is impossible to destroy by the material means, by tangible tools. It was energy that remained in these territories. It was energy that draws all people of our time who are striving for self-development. And maybe that's why modern practitioners, regardless of their race, nationality, or ideology, are drawn to places such as Mount Kailash to get in touch with the ancient wisdom, to get their knowledge, that will allow us to continue on the path of self-development and help to develop this world. There is a saying, if you want to know your friend, go with him to the mountains. Every time the group is formed to go on the defined route, it doesn't happen spontaneously. And it's not random people that randomly got together, randomly wanted to go. We incarnate each time with certain teams. And these teams are created for a specific purpose. There is this point of view that we agree to come into this world and do some work that we all need. And when we go to the mountains, it can be seen and noticed to the max. The coherence of the structure is very clear, so we talk less, but understand each other better. Each one ensures and supports the other, with minimal movements, by looking at each other. All this leads to the fact that we realize that we've been together more than one life. We became a team a long, long time ago, before this incarnation. And this is very significant. We help each other grow spiritually and help to fulfill those missions, those tasks, those goals that we set for ourselves. And the mountains manifest this bond. When people come to me and say, I don't believe in everything you say, past lives, karma, and so on and so forth, I always wonder, and how can one believe in something that one never experienced? How much time did people devote to remembering their previous lives, reincarnations? None at all. But for some reason, they decided that they don't believe. Can you imagine? During the daytime, we look at the sky. The sun is shining brightly. The sky is blue. But we cannot see the stars. But it doesn't mean that there are no stars. If we met about 10 years ago, I would have been a tough nihilist, skeptic, who denied everything that you couldn't touch with your hands and impossible to explain with the language of physics, mathematics. But some time went by, and my view of reality has changed. And I believe that the pilgrimage to some places dramatically changes the view of reality. And people start to understand that it's quite possible that they have already been here before. Subjectively, in my opinion, if the person came here at least once, most likely he has a karmic connection with this place. And while visiting some monasteries, lakes, rivers, it's quite possible for him to stir his karmic memory accidentally, spontaneously, even if he didn't intend to it. I will remember this one experience for a long time. When, near the Bodhmoth Stupa in Kathmandu, I had a memory as if I had already been near this stupa some time ago, and had also sung the mantra with this one person. And it was a unique experience. And this thought came to both of us at the same time. And there are one, two, three, ten of such memories that you can add together. When you visit these places, if you have good karma and a pure enough consciousness, you will be able to remember it. But it's like in the Matrix. Morpheus gave two pills to Neo. The question is, what are you going to do next? Forget this and say, yeah, well, this is nonsense, I made it up. Or use it. If you can take advantage of this, your development can go much faster. It was Cora 
a circuit around Kailash that was so unpredictable to me. It was unexpected, fast, and I wasn't ready for this meeting at all. I assume that we all roughly know our lives, who we are in these lives, our profession, social status, what we like, what we don't like. But the energy near Kailash rips off all masks, and one cannot prepare for this. Nobody warns about it. And you suddenly are left by yourself. That goal to get to know yourself, to meet with yourself, sure, sounded very um, romantic, very inspiring. But how it happened in my case, for example, actually proved to be, to some extent, painful. While descending the Dromala Pass, I walked with my head empty, with no thoughts, and there was our guide in front. He walked next to me because I was the last one. I saw him bending and picking up something, and I thought, what is he doing? And he collected empty plastic bottles that were thrown by tourists who passed before us. And I suddenly realized that we too often take the teachings that we encounter literally. And we don't pay attention to such seemingly little things that make up our lives. Life must be lived more attentively, more consciously. We should look around. After all, compassion is one of the most important qualities that should be cultivated in ourselves. As barley seeds need a while to get into the soil, sprout, grow, and only then they can be collected. So people can realize the results of this trip only a few months later, someone maybe a few years later. The fact is that this place, of course, changes karma and life of a person for sure. The question's how, in which direction, how quickly, one will know for oneself. The blessed work of artists and sculptors. In Tibet, there is a pagoda of thousand Buddhas. Here, you can witness, without believing the words, that Dharma is given to all living beings. The faces of sculptors inside are diverse. Those people lived far away from the Buddha, seeing the essence of the pure teachings. They joined the path of Tathagata. The Buddha's teaching was given for any living being, regardless of age, gender or nationality. And now these stupas help us to see and accept that this is not some alien idea, specifically for Asians, but it is the teaching that helps to transform ourselves. I would like to express my deep gratitude to Tibet, the Tibetan people, for keeping the Buddha's teaching and that they cherish the teaching that Padmasambhava passed to them. The Buddha's teachings in Tibet underwent several changes of formation. It faded away and reappeared. Now comes the gradual, gradual dawn. We see that the monasteries are starting to be restored again. I hope that in the future, the trend will continue. I hope that every year, there will be more and more monks in these monasteries. Buddha's teaching will once again flourish in these lands and spread around the globe. Friends, we are on the Koro route around the Jokong Temple. A huge number of pilgrims are doing their Kora. We finished our Kora around Kailash. We descended to a lower altitude. Breathing feels completely different here. There is a lot of energies of desires, the energies of this city. Perhaps Kora is what begins much earlier than we begin the physical path around Kailash and also ends much later. 
This was my third cohort. On one hand, it was one of the most difficult ones. On the other, the most exciting, interesting cohort, which has brought a lot of inner discoveries. Glory to Kailash. When I was packing for the trip, I thought that this Quora would be easier. I was preparing, planning, tuning in, but as another experience showed, every time Kailash tests you differently, and no matter how much you prepare, it's hard to guess what your test will be this time. On this journey, I came to conclusion that I need to pay the most attention to my internal work. I thought that I wasn't strong enough, that I didn't have the endurance, or maybe I didn't eat right and paid a lot of attention to that. Now I understand that if I maybe paid more attention to internal work and communication with people, maybe Cora would have gone differently. But I hope I will have another chance to test myself. Sure, there were very strong impressions or feelings in certain places. There were spontaneous tears, absolutely inexplicable. I could laugh a moment ago, then the bus made another turn. I saw a monastery and I couldn't hold back my emotions. My tears started to flow. My feeling as if we connected to some high voltage power and what inside either hadn't functioned or was asleep, dozing off, began to manifest itself more clearly. This experience of connecting to a higher voltage power and being able to see what it manifests in me, this is incredibly valuable. One can probably really say that Cora brings to the surface new facets of personality, both positive and negative. It's possible that someone will be disappointed after the trip, that there are no miracles and life doesn't change immediately and instantly. Cora just shows new energies in you. You may or may not like them. And it will depend only on the work of the person himself, how much they will grow in him and how his future life will change. The most important thing is that every year Kailash meets each group in its own way. This year, for the first time in all the years of travel, we had rain, even a little hail on the first day of Cora, just an hour of this test, then everything was stable. The next day at Drolmala, we had very good weather, Kailash was fully visible, all participants were able to reach it with no problems. We went not just for nothing, we were preparing, we were trying to stabilize our thoughts, not to go in some disarray. Everybody came with a goal, you need to walk Cora to overcome certain austerities. Yes, Cora is always austerity. Yes, some have blisters, but how can one go without it during Cora? Maybe someone experienced some mysterious things. But for me, the most important thing is for the group to start together and get back together. Lives, bodies, and names will continue to change. The karma seeds will eventually grow. And over and over, on the sacred path, we'll walk the eternal Kora again. Oh, no, mom.
Peru Draya Hari Om Tatsa Om Namah 